Okay, cool. No, there is just no good talk to skip. Uh, I, 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 I took a big breath first and I just wanted yeah. to eat something like a tree the uh, after all the talk just before the accident. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just, I'll, I just, I'll pick up this again and run anyway. Okay, can everyone please settle down and then we can uh, get started on Sylvain's talk, so. Like, people in there, yeah, just either sit down or leave. <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, good morning. Thank you for being here. So, uh, a, f a few words about me, uh, in case you don't know me. Uh, I'm Sylvain Muno. Uh, I'm speak up, okay? Uh, so, uh, my name is Sylvain Muno. Uh, I'm uh, I'm an engineer, and I, I um, I'm generally interested in everything that's low level. And recently, I got interested in everything that's radio and communication protocol and stuff like that. And I work inside the Osmocom project, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So, uh, what is Osmocom? So, Osmocom stands for Open Source Mobile Communications. Uh, and basically what it is, it's, uh, it's a sort of an umbrella project. Uh, it's a collection of sub-projects that are all related to uh, the open source and, and free software implementation of, of various communication protocols. It all started like in 2010 uh, with uh, OpenBSC. Um, and we needed to create other projects, uh, and we needed a good naming scheme, and so we, we came up with uh, Osmocom and uh, the Osmo prefix that we know uh, um, often use. Uh, it was really centered around GSM at the very beginning because it's it's part of uh, of a GSM project. But nowadays we have uh, many more protocols and and stuff uh, things that have nothing to do with GSM, and a growing number of them. Is, uh, is now involving a software-defined radio because it's just a very easy way to implement new protocols without having to buy uh, extensive hardware. And so today what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to give you a very short introduction to uh, all projects that are related to SDR. We have quite a, a, a number of them, so it's going to be really a, sh a short introduction to each project, hopefully, um, so you can you know see what interests you and dig a little deeper uh, on our website or other talks that have been done uh, on those projects. Most of the projects I'm going to present um, have had dedicated talks just to each of them uh, in the past. So, yeah, it's a short intro introduction. Obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm not actively involved in all of these. Uh, a few of these are, are, are I'm the maintainer of, but uh, uh, some other I've not, never even used, so I just uh, try to ask the author to what to say about them. So I, I classified them in three main categories. The first one deals with uh, everything that's uh, interface with the um, the external world, um, what I call radio front end. The other uh, another category is like signal browsing, so you can visualize signals or like standalone SDR application. And finally, um, really just implementation of a given protocol and, and how to deal with that specific protocols. So um, actually, SDR is probably the most well-known uh, of our project because it it, uh, it really boomed like in uh, mid-2012 or, or something like that when uh, um, a kernel developer essentially de discovered that some of those DVB-T dongles that you, that you could buy for very cheap had some kind of SDR mode uh, where you can get uh, raw IQ samples. Um, at that point, uh, an Osmocom developer um, basically created the library so that you could actually use that SDR mode and uh, um, integrate it into your own project and thus was born uh, the RTL SDR project and the lib RTL SDR that corresponds to that. So those DVPT dongles, they're, I mean, they're really cheap because I mean, they're, they're mass manufactured and they're, they're meant to receive TV. Um, but you, you have kind of a debug mode where you can use the raw hardware and, and get the IQ sample and it has everything that uh, a, a classic um, zero IF or low IF um, direct conversion receiver has. So basically you have the antenna, uh, an amplifier, some kind of filtering, a mixer down to baseband where it's sampled into um, you know, IQ complex uh, that you can get and feed to whatever algorithm you want. Um, I mean, on the other hand, you kind of get what you pay for, right? I mean, in, in absolute terms, the RF performance is terrible. Uh, <laughs> 
There is spurs all over the place, the sensitivity isn't the best, you only get like 2.4 mega samples per second, and even then you're not always sure that you don't have discontinuities in the stream and stuff like that. Uh, but it's a great way to get started to, uh, for SDR with basically no investment. Um, so if you don't have one, I definitely recommend that you that you get one. Um, because it's also so small, you can just have it all the time with you, right? It's, it takes basically no place. And although the performance isn't good, it's still uh, very much sufficient for a lot of, uh, I mean, a lot of stuff. I mean, pretty much all the protocols we've implemented, we've managed to implement them using um, this dongle because um, you know, as long as you're not working, uh, you're really at the edge of performance and trying to dig out signals out of the noise, uh, you're gonna have sufficient signal to noise ratio and with all the error corrector codes and stuff like that, you'll manage to recover the, the signal without much, <coughs> much trouble. So, uh, another project which, which is less known is the um, Myriad DR, and basically, I mean, the first project was meant for the Realtek chip and Mirix, another manufacturer, has basically the same fun feature in their chip uh, and so uh, an equivalent library was created. Um, it's more of a proof of concept right now because even though the hardware itself has better spec on paper, um, there are some serious downsides. Uh, first, they're kind of hard to get. Uh, I mean, back when I bought one of them to test, um, I had to go through... Uh, you know, a, Japan, a Japanese mail for water because there was no way to order them here in Europe. Um, they're more expensive. And the, m the biggest downside of all is the, the actual tuner, so that you can tune to different um, uh, frequency, all over the, the frequency b uh, range. They have different antenna input depending on which band you're in. And most of the dongle you can buy, uh, only one of these inputs is connected to an antenna connector. All the others are just connected to ground. Uh, and so you have a, a very small frequency range that you can actually use even though the hardware can do better. And with all those very small uh, QFN chips, it's nearly impossible to go and solder another antenna. So um, if another manufacturer came out with you know different, uh, uh, different antenna inputs or stuff like that, it would probably uh, be worth investigating. But so far, if you have a choice, I definitely recommend that you get a HLSDR instead. Now, of course, these are just raw libraries, and, and we wanted to use that in, well, new radio, of course. Uh, and so Dimitri here um, um, started working on GR Osmo SDR. And GR Osmo SDR is essentially a hardware abstraction block. Uh, it started only as a source so that you can receive, but now you have also a sync so that you can transmit with hardware that supports it. Um, and what it allows you is to essentially create a new radio application um, you just use that source or that sync block and whatever uh, hardware the user has, it's going to work for it. Uh, it has a, a, a large number of backends uh, nowadays. I mean, you can read from file that you previously sa saved. It's, you can use the FunCube dongle. Um, everything that uh, uses UHD, that means all the ATUS USAP, uh, you can use them with. Uh, um, and also the, the UMTRX, it has support for some just, uh, Osmo SDR, which is some uh, Osmo from actual hardware, but it's not actually available uh, currently. Uh, you can support the actual SDR, you can support the mirror SDR, you can support the ACRF, the Blade RF, and the upcoming SPI, and some RF space receiver that are targeted at uh, AM radio, I think. Um, so, and, and all those, bo the, the support for all those boards are, has been made possible by, uh, by all the hardware vendors that have been kind enough to provide hardware so that we can uh, uh, develop and, and, and test uh, which is pretty important, and so a big thanks to them. Um, that block is, is now used in, in, a, in a wide variety of projects. I think maybe the most um, user-friendly one is GQRX. And also the block, so for those that don't know, GQRX is a, like a, a, a generic SDR application where you can listen to uh, FM signal or AM signal and stuff like that. And underneath, it uses GNU Radio, and among which it uses the GR Osmo SDR source to support um, all those hardware as inputs. And if you're creating a, a, a GNU Radio application, I definitely recommend that you use uh, GR Osmo SDR um, block um, as a source. It's, I mean, it kind of depends on your application. If your application has very specific requirements that are pretty uh, tied to the hardware that you're using, of course it's not going to work, but most of them are not that tied to the hardware. They just, they just want samples, basically, and, and this would work great. Um, 
the block actually comes with some sample applications so that once you install it, you can actually directly start using it. Uh, and it has a BIOS 150, which is a, a quick and uh, like quick and dirty uh, spectrum analyzer. You launch it and you can just close the spectrum using the default uh, clean radio instrumentation stuff. And you have a, a SIG gen, um, <coughs> which is basically the equivalent in the other source, in the other direction, where you can easily uh, like generate a tune or, or, or a modulated signal or or even actually GSM bursts. Uh, just um, just to test your hardware quickly. So now we kind of move on to uh, visualization, and there is two main applications. Uh, one is called Strange Love, and the other is called uh, Phosphor. Uh, this was what, uh, what Strange Love looks like, and uh, you'll see that Phosphor looks very similar, and there's a, a very good reason for that. Uh, so what Strangelove is, is a, a standalone uh, application. It, it doesn't rely on GNU Radio, it's kind of uh, an equivalent to uh, GQRX or to SDR Sharp or um, HDSDR or, or that kind of application where you can tune to a signal and, and just listen to it. Um, one of its main features is obviously its, its display, uh, which is very nice, but in, in the case of Strangelove it's also very um, CPU intensive which means it it was originally targeted at hardware that could provide only a few mega samples of, uh, of uh, like sample rate like the Osmo DR or the, uh, the, uh, the RTL SDR dongles uh, it's been extended to actually be able to use the GR Osmo SDR uh, uh, you can if you have new radio and GR Osmo SDR installed you can just use them and then Zdrangelov will actually use new radio as a sample source but you can also compile GR Osmo SDR in some special standalone mode um, for this application in particular. Um, one of another of its interesting features is the, the, the ability to uh, select a piece of spectrum, channelize it and send it to an external application so that you can uh, use this application to uh, bookmark uh, frequency and, and channels and tune to them, select just the channel you want and then send that to an external application that will then do the processing like uh, for example uh, uh, DSD or, or, or some other application that expect pre-channelized data um, at their input. So uh, this is faster and as you can see the, the, the kind of display is very similar and that happened because of the performance issue of Zvangelov. Um, I don't have the latest laptop and um, you know when you get on, on, on my uh, like core to core to duo CPU, I can maybe process like two two megahertz of spectrum using Strangelove, and that's just not enough when you have a SDR nowadays that provides you know like um, later on it's like 40 megahertz of spectrum, the P200 is like 56, and I know you get you know uh, people with 200 megahertz, and all, uh, uh, so yeah, processing everything on the CPU just doesn't cut it. So I, I wrote a, a phosphor, which is essentially a, a complete rewrite of the, UR, of the uh, display part of Zdrangelov, but using um, GPU processing and also designed as a, as a GNU radio blog, because that's the other thing, is I wanted to be able to use it in GNU radio. Um, and so this is essentially what, uh, what uh, phosphor is. It's, uh, it's GPU accelerated, which means, well, you need a GPU, and you need a GPU with uh, good enough drivers that they support um, OpenCL and even more what's called uh, OpenCL, OpenGL interop, which means the cooperation and sharing of buffers between the actual rendering part and the computing part. Um, on on OS 6, it means pretty much a uh, recent hardware should be supported. Should be everything above the HD 4000. Actually, even the HD 4000, uh, but only on Mac OS 10.9. Um, if you're on Linux, that pretty much means only ATI and NVIDIA. Um, there is some effort to support the Intel um, with the so-called Venier project. But it's, um, I don't know its state. I just know that it doesn't support all the features that are required so far. But hopefully, they'll get there, and that that would be really great. <laughs> So I'm oh, I'm hoping to to be able to <coughs> backport that display also in Strangelove and it's um, also integrated in uh, GR Osmo SDR, which means if if you launch the Osmo Com F50 uh, demo application with the uh, um, you know uppercase F option, then instead of using the default WX widget, you'll use the um, 
the phosphor rendering, which looks much nicer. Uh, so I'd like to do also some, some time to explain exactly what is in that display, because uh, it looks good, but it, it's also useful, right? It's, uh, it, it has some, some really interesting properties. So at its core, of, obviously, it's a basically an FFT. Um, it, it's a, it's real-time uh, real spectrum. Uh, one particularity is that every single input sample will go through at least one FFT. <coughs> Uh, in the future, we're actually hoping to that it will go uh, through several FFT, and it's important because if you have very short transient burst, um, like of interference or, or whatever that's you know lasts for a very short time, if you take the approach that's used by the default syncing new radio, they only take like a thousand um, um, a thousand sample, like ten times per second. But if you have bursts that last for less than that. Um, you might never see them. Um, in the case also of uh, phosphor and Sanjlov, you will definitely see them because uh, every single sample is, is, is processed. Uh, and so they will definitely appear in the water for the, the spectrum on display. Um, compared to some other waterfall, like uh, you saw the waterfall in from the uh, talk, um, the, the waterfall in here is much, much faster in the sense that it display like only a few hundred milliseconds of past samples and that means when you have open protocols that uh, change frequency very fast or when you have things like uh, um, frequency block allocation LTE uh, like for example in, in the screenshot here uh, yeah so this is a LTE signal for those of you who haven't recognized it and and you can clearly see like the pilot the the, the periodic uh, pilots uh, here and the block allocation and stuff like that, and you can see that uh, uh, well enough um, that you wouldn't see in in the default uh, things. Um, and of course, it's in, in more than the waterfall. It also displays the light spectrum. Uh, it's averaged, and again, since we have so many uh, so many FFT, so many spectra coming back. Uh, we can actually do pretty long averaging, which means it flattens out the noise. But I mean, even if you average a thousand spectra uh, at a, a thousand points per spectra, and you have uh, forty thousand, uh, you know, mega samples per second, uh, your time constant is still only like uh, twenty-five milliseconds, um, which means you've got a, a very flat flo uh, noise floor, but you still have a very much. Uh, a lot of responsiveness uh, when new signals appear and stuff like that. You, you don't actually see the average. Um, and of course, the, the main feature is the, the histogram, which is the, that kind of display that you get on, on IN spectrum uh, analyzer, which shows a statistical distribution of the signal. And if you go back to, to the screenshot, you can, for example, here clearly see that. You can use this. Uh, yeah, you can clearly see that. So this is the noise, and you can see uh, kind of the spread of it. And you can see that there is two main power levels for the signal, and in the middle there is pretty much nothing, and that's essentially a reflection that either on the FD there is nothing between the gaps, or you have transmission of blocks, and um, that kind of things. So, uh, so that's pretty much it for uh, for uh, signal browsing and display. And I'm going to move on to a real uh, implementation of protocols. So, the first one I'm going to talk about is called GMR, and GMR stands for Geo Mobile Radio, and Geo stands for uh, Geosynchronous Earth Orbit, and it's essentially a satellite uh, communication protocol. It's heavily inspired by GSM. Pretty much everything above layer 3 is going to be GSM, and everything below has just been modified enough to work on high latency links and, and stuff like that, and to save power, because obviously when you're in a satellite, you don't want to waste power transmitting a constant beacon for no reason, um, and that kind of stuff. Um, its main user is Turaya, which is a, a big uh, like sat, sat phone provider in Asia. Um, I think there are some usage of GMR protocol in the US, but not really targeted at consumer, more like machine to machine and stuff like that. Um, however, I've, I've never had actually the chance to search for, uh, for any of those. Um, the, current the current implementation, sorry, is pretty much um, 
it has a, a complete file um, in the sense, well, complete in the sense it implements all the channel coding and stuff like that and TDMA patterns, uh, both for TX and for RX. The actual SDR part currently is perception only, but transmitting should actually be fairly easy to implement. I mean, it's just uh, QPSK, it's much easier to modulate a signal than trying to recover it. Um, so it, it should go fairly easy to, to implement. It's, it uses GNU Radio uh, to channelize. It, it's not directly linked to GNU Radio, basically it, it compiles independently, but it expects pre-channelized data. And, um, I mean, there was no point for us to just re-implement channelizer when they exist in GNU Radio. And so what we essentially do is we use a GNU Radio application that will take um, a chunk of spectrum, uh, go through a resampler, then a polyphase um, a channelizer block, and ship that to a bunch of named pipes on Linux. And uh, each of those pipes actually represent one channel. Uh, and those uh, are used by the, uh, the, Osmo, the actual Osmo GMR application um, that will take the samples, demodulate the broad, well, search for broadcast channels. Uh, when it finds some, um, um, actually follow them, decode the, decode the packets take those packets, forward them to Wireshark, and when it sees its channel being assigned, it will actually follow those channels. Uh, if you provided the, pro the proper decryption key, will actually decrypt them, uh, take the voice packets, save them on disk, um, and that kind of stuff. Um, so as I said, we forward them to Wireshark, and there's a good reason for that, is that we implemented um, a Wireshark dissector, which means you can actually uh, inspect the different uh, uh, packets and, and what they contain in Wireshark uh, uh, pretty easily and we implemented both uh, the GMR specific packets and f as I said it's heavily based on GSM which means pretty much every layer 3 message that was already a sector in Wireshark that had been written by um, uh, people, I don't know who but <laughs> somebody wrote them sometime and we're very grateful that they did uh, uh, and so we just reused that. <coughs> As part of the project, we also, um, the, the cipher itself was reverse engineered in parallel by, uh, by us and by uh, un the University of Bochum uh, in Germany, and, and they published their result and, and we actually validated them uh, with real on air data. They, they presented an attack uh, on the cipher, which is really slow. We kind of developed our own, which is really fast. Uh, <laughs> I mean, to, to give you an idea of the level of security uh, in, in, in you know, sat phones, it, it takes less than one second to recover the crypto key. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Even when you're decoding your own call, it's, it's just faster to just crack the key than, than uh, reading it. Um, we had another problem is the voice codec. The voice codec is a properly, properly uh, AMB variant, and if there are some M in the room, you might know D-star and, and all the kind of protocol that they all use uh, AMB variant, but they're different enough from each other that you can't actually reuse uh, the, the decoder. And uh, last December, we actually reverse engineer completely the, uh, the voice codec, and we now have a, a clean C implementation of, uh, of the voice decoder for, for the codec. And, uh, and what we're looking now no, for the next step in the project is we're looking at GMPRS, which is essentially the uh, internet over the satellite connection, which completely different protocols and stuff. Um, maybe adding some TX support so that we can actually, you know, start like a sat phone base station on Earth. Uh, because for GSM you can experiment and buy old hardware. They just don't sell old satellites. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, shipping with the <laughs> <laughs> and we're looking into a better new radio integration, essentially, so that uh, everything can happen inside new radio. And um, especially for GMPRS, you just the the current approach we're taking with the polyphase ch channelizer is, is has some limitation. So we're looking into, uh, that. Um, oh yeah, something I forgot. Uh, we actually have a map on the on the project. We're trying to to collect as much GMR data as as possible. So if you're interested, definitely collect some data and send, send them to us so that uh, uh, we can collect more information about uh, the, the broadcast channels and, and we're trying to get more data, especially in Asia. And also, if, in, if you're in the US, 
I'm pretty sure there's some GMR signal there, uh, but I don't know where, so you have to look. Uh, and since it's satellite, you pretty much need a directional antenna, so yeah. Um, another project uh, we created is, is uh, Tetra, Osmo Tetra. So Tetra stands for Terrestrial Trunk Radio. And it's a digital, you know, trunk radio system that's targeted at government agency, emergency services, and that kind of stuff. Um, it's widely used in in Europe in general. I don't know about the rest of the world exactly. I know it's used here in Belgium. Uh, if you look around 390 megahertz, you'll find uh, what's called Air Street here in Belgium, which is the the Tetra network used by police and and stuff like that. Uh, it's encrypted since since we published Osmo Tetra, uh, pretty much. <laughs> when we started it, it wasn't, and then we kind of tweeted that it, oh my god, it's not encrypted, and like six months later, they encrypted it. Uh, <laughs> if you go through Brussels Airport, you can look at our around 410 megahertz, there's an unencrypted Tetra network there, uh, just for the airport people, basically, and, and they, they all have this Motorola radio. Um, so Tetra is pretty much the same thing, it's, you have a... Fi and Mac implementation uh, as a separate application. We use the radio um, for both for channelization and the actual demodulation. Uh, we actually we use the demodulator from uh, another GNU radio project from up 25 um, because it's for FSK and for FSK demodulator. Um, again, we use named pipe between between application to pass data around. Um, we have a Wireshark dissector that was. Um, actually kind of generated by us, but not, we didn't do most of the work. Some university in China uh, somehow described the entire Tetra protocol in ASN1. Uh, and then from ASN1, we could generate automatically a package from Wireshark. Uh, so yeah, we're very grateful that they, that they wrote that and that they let us use it. Uh, but that was really nice, because if you haven't write, written Wireshark Dissector, it's really boring work. I mean, it's basically descripting, de describing every little field uh, with the help text and a name. And oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> um, we have voice support. In this case, the codec is actually a public. There's a reference implementation. It's not, you know, it's not free software. The license is not. Um, I can't take it and redistribute it. But we have something that essentially downloads it, patches. It, it's not in master yet, but there's, there will hopefully be some some work done on it too. Um, you know, make it more user friendly. Um, and the last project is uh, Op25. So Op25 Op is actually a project that didn't start as an Osmocom project, and and it kind of joined us uh, after what, and and no, we we kind of owes them. Uh, I've never used it myself, mostly because Op25 is kind of the equivalent of Tetra, but for uh, other part of the world, mainly in the US and. Uh, Australia and, and Canada. Uh, so if, from, if you're from there, you should definitely check it out uh, because you most likely have some P25 um, radio signal there. It's entirely based on new radio and it's pretty complete. I mean, they have everything you know from the monitor to the complete protocol stack to uh, implementation of the codec, and uh, they also implemented a uh, Wireshark <coughs> package section and, and all the crypto stuff. They've recently updated it to, uh, they've switched from SVN to Git, and at the same time, they've kind of made some architectural changes, uh, including, uh, um, you know, changes to the latest GR 3.7 API. They also use uh, uh, some uh, some of the more advanced features of GR Osmo SDR for tuning and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's definitely, um, a, definitely a great project and a, a, definitely a good example to, to follow if, if yeah. So um, that's pretty much it. I'd, I'd like to, uh, you know, well, first thank you for your attention and thanks uh, every uh, uh, developer uh, of Osmocom that actually works on those projects and, and in general in all the SDR projects. We need we need more people working on this stuff um, to hopefully both make them more advanced and also make them more accessible to uh, a wider audience. And and there's really a wide variety of of tasks to be done and not only you know hardcore DSP stuff. So yeah. Um, yeah, if you have any questions. Uh.
part. Yes. Um, is there a way to actually visualize, easy visualize small packets which come up randomly? The problem if you do water graph, you only have packets. Sometimes it's a bit slow, and then you have a packet size of that where you go to the detail. Oh, yes, fast, and then by the time you have to something, it's gone. Is there a way to trigger? No, there is, there is no trigger yet, but I was talking about doing like things like uh, spectrum-based triggering and that kind of stuff. Uh, but it's, it's really advanced um, kind of stuff that I... I definitely would like that because, as, as you said, it, there is no good compromise. Uh, either you just don't see them or, or they just appear as like a, a line. And Currently, I, I'm planning on adding like a pose mode so they can at least pose the spectrum and inspect it in, in, in closer look. But... Uh, um, you know, automatic triggering would definitely be good, but it's not there uh, currently. Yeah, another question for the, uh, it's not really awesome, but for the hardware kind. Yeah. Do you support something that can transmit, say, 20 watts? Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, no, no, not, <laughs> I not directly. Like I, I don't. Two megabits of second on, on UHF or half a megabit yeah. on. I mean, you can do it, but usually it's not really our problem in the sense that you will connect to SDR, and then that SDR will transmit a signal. If you want to transmit 20 watts, you're probably going to want to filter that signal at the output of the SDR, then go yeah. through possibly a preamplifier, then another filter, then finally the power amplifier. Uh, but most of the SDR I know don't have 20 watt power transistor <laughs> on them. Yeah, but there is one. It's the HP SDR. It has a PA of 20 watts. Right, really. Yeah, the HPSDR was it's that's an amateur radio project most yeah. basically. So yeah, they're they're interested in that. Ah, we didn't funny we I don't the yeah. price of the <laughs> <laughs> Well, real stuff costs money. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he says that it's free resource. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Is your project related to open BTS in some uh, sense? Um not 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 that much actually. Open BTS th there is some relation. Uh, in the sense that, uh, so OpenBTS is mainly two applications, I'd say. It's one implements like layer two, layer three, and stuff, and one is like the actual uh, radio modem uh, part. And the radio modem part has kind of been uh, split off, it's maintained by uh, Thomas Tzu, which I saw, but I don't know if he's here. Okay. Uh, yeah, he's there <laughs> in the back. And he's maintaining that the, the actual uh, uh, SDR part. Um, of this, and I, I mean, although it's we know us this uh, on our Git, um, and and this is wh what he maintains. I just didn't include it here because it's it's still mainly the work of uh, the Open BTS guys who, yeah, who did it originally. Yes. What is currently known about the Tetra encryption? Ah, uh, <coughs> nothing. <laughs> I mean, uh, really, not that much. Uh, the sp the spec don't don't specify it. So, and even oh, man, the it's very hard to test because it's very hard to get um, actual Tetra hardware that both supports encryption and that you can easily play with. I mean, we have some Tetra radio. Some of them actually support the encryption, but we have absolutely no way of loading encryption keys in them. Uh, we have no idea how it works because it's it's I mean you just can't get the documentation uh, it's usually done at the factory or provisioned by through a, a big system and so basically we just know that we don't really know much and certainly not enough to do anything about it yeah, because I know the sad phones were uh, like they had their firmware uh, reverse engineer because it was freely available on the internet yes uh, and uh, we, we can do that for the radio too uh, the problem is in Tetra there is it's not as, I mean, in the set phone case, uh, in the spec, you basically add the, uh, a nice block schematic, and everything was known except for um, the actual encryption algorithm, right? But, but its input and its output were all specified and stuff. In Tetra, you have the encryption algorithm th that is secret. Then you have the key derivation algorithm that are secret. And they all, there's a bunch of them that are secret. And even if you reverse engineer the stuff, you have no idea what is what. And without the ability to actually test on real hardware to confirm that you know uh, what you found is actually the real algorithm and you can actually decrypt the, the, the bits, uh, you're just basically doing uh, work blind. Um, 
And so if any of you has any contact in Tetra that can provide us like a radio that can transmit with a known key, that'd be really helpful. <laughs> yeah. Two quick questions about Tetra. Yeah. Uh, one is, uh, do you know if, uh, if you use Tetra as uh, simply a packet data radio? Yeah. Uh, are there any patterns that apply? I have no idea. <laughs> Honestly, I, I, I just gave up on patents. Sorry. When when Google bought Motorola, do you know if they got the patents for Tetra? I have no idea. Sorry. As I said, I, a lot of stuff are patented and yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I I figured pretty much all of them have patents, and if I stopped implementing stuff because they're patented, just. <laughs> Okay. But the second question is, do you know if there is some sort of EU directive uh, deregulating Tetra in the future for our assembly? Oh, so that you can transmit Tetra in the in, uh, ambience? Because it's very strictly regulated right now. Yes, yes, sir. I mean, um, no, I have no idea. Uh, I think, so. I mean, when you buy like Tetra radio, you can buy them for different bands. Uh, I don't know if any of them actually overlaps with... Uh, I mean, uh, one of them is, is like near, f one of the Tetra band is near 433, right? But I don't know if it's, I mean, just because the frequency is right doesn't mean you'd actually have the right to transmit on it, so, yeah. Uh, legislation and me, it's not there. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. In green. Yeah, one question, you mentioned that you're using the GPU inside the radio and GR plus for yes. the FFP. Yeah. And how much work would it be to adapt the, your code that the GPU is doing something entirely different? So you have a um, code processor. It wouldn't be that much work, but it really, d I mean, okay. So currently what I'm doing is I'm taking the samples, I ship them to the GPU, and then I never see them again. Because transferring data from the main memory to the GPU is, um, uh, takes a lot of time. I mean, for the high end graphic cards that can process like 200 megahertz of spectrum, copying the data is like 90% of the execution of the time, right? Uh, and so I'm not going to copy like a, a, a big chunk of data, then do an FFT and then copy them back. Uh, FFTW is just faster. If you, if, you had, if you were doing a, a lot of, uh, of stuff, then it would be worth it. But um, yeah. If I can jump in, we do have a project called GRGPU. Uh, you can find it on GitHub. Uh, that is basically what you're asking for. And it basically has like a, a block that moves data to the device memory. Then you write your computer you radio blocks and uh, GPU code, which was CUDA. Now, now they support OpenCL. And then you have a block that brings it back from device yeah. to host memory. Yeah. Uh, it's not perfect. There's still, there's still a ways to go, but, but, but there is support. OK. Uh, yeah, sure. Do you have plans for LTE and LTE safety, which is the next plan? Um, plans, not exactly. I mean, we, we usually don't plan that much. Uh, <laughs> we just, uh, you know, uh, oh, that looks interesting. We're going to look at it. Uh, but most of the time, that kind of implies that we have hardware or some, you know, something to look at uh, beside the spec because just reading specification is also not that interesting and so we, we like at least I like to look at signals and the spec in, in parallel and so until I don't actually have LTE in Belgium uh, so yeah yeah sure yeah. when we talk about digital radio software defined or other software uh, you mentioned here AMBE and Vista codex yeah Yes. Close standards, close codes. But we have here in Europe digital uh, mobile radio. Yes. It's open standard is approved. Is having all the uh, regulatory and the technical setup. Is a good money for for software uh, developers. Have you considered? Have you, did you look to, to the European? Uh, yeah, but. Chart? M most of the time, we, uh, I mean, when I started like the GMR project, I thought there was a reference codec implementation in the spec because every other protocol I did before, there was a reference codec. And so it's only when I, you know, I extracted and, and took the voice packets and then, okay, I go to the GMR site and I look for the reference codec and just can't find it. And it's, what the fuck? Uh, and so that's only at that time uh, that I realized that I needed to actually reverse engineer the codec. Um, yeah, but uh, if I had the choice, I'd take open codecs, of course. But yeah. Yeah, since I'm implementing existing protocols, I take what, whatever they chose in the spec, right?
Yes. So I was wondering, is there anything else out there for DMR? So I've used DST before, but it expects like OSS. Which yeah, I, I, I've never really played with uh, DMR. I just know uh, there is a GRDSD block. I tried it a, a couple of uh, uh, um, days ago, and it works. I, I tried it. I tried it for D Star, and it worked. Um, but yeah, I don't have any DMR radio to try. So, sorry. Okay, I think we probably over time already. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, I can take my stick. Yeah, just really? thank you. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Bring more chocolate. <laughs> Don't don't worry. Don't worry about your